the bottom line. The Stone Cold sets it. I have a lot of things I want to get off my chest. This is The Pencil, a professional wrestling podcast starring Rennie D and friends. Thanks for listening to The Pencil. Subscribe to the show on iTunes and follow us on Twitter at Pencil Podcast. Hey, this is Chris Jericho. You're listening to The Pencil with Rennie D. Pencil, baby. He's a pencil. Yeah, boy. Well, here we are, man. 20 episodes in, and uh, we're still alive, so that's a good thing, right? It is, it is. It's a really good thing, and uh, this is The Pencil. It's the professional wrestling podcast coming at you live from Dirt's Place in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Nice and cold day, 20 degrees. Uh, Before we hop into things, obviously, as you guys know, this is a fan and a listener-supported podcast, supported by people just like you, and that might sound familiar, because Colt Cabana says it, and I stole it from him, because he does things right. So, do us a favor, go on iTunes, subscribe, so that way the new episodes come automatically to your iPad or iPhone, if you don't have an iDevice, or an Apple device, rather, whenever you guys access your stuff on Android, but subscribe, rate, review, and share on any social media platform, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Vine, whatever. Uh, that would be huge for the show. Visit us online, PencilPodcast.com or at PencilPodcast on Twitter. We got a good show for you tonight. It is episode 20. We have Justin Labar from WrestleZone.com, former writer for Bleacher Report, the lead man for the Chill Shot reality show that you guys see out there on TV, and also has his foot in the door with the WWE as far as the going on in the company. And we had a good conversation with him about this past week's NXT event, this past week, past week TLC, and just a lot of odd and end stuff in pro wrestling. It was actually a really good conversation that we had, Dirt. Yeah, you'll need to stay on and listen to Justin Labar. He's a really good, really good interview. He had a lot of good information that guys like Ryan and I might not always have, but he's got that inside track with a lot of guys. He makes some comments about conversations that he's had with Triple H, people that he's talked to about Vince McMahon, about really important things that were pretty interesting whenever we were talking about it. Very, very interesting, and it's uh, been an interesting week. Speaking, speaking of interesting, Ryan. Speaking. What... Uh, there, there's talk, and I believe, though, you've confirmed this with me, that we're going to be able to be doing this this podcast in person a lot more, and you might be finding your way back to the beautiful state of Minnesota. Is this correct? Can you confirm? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I've been kind of leaving subtle hints on social media platforms lately that that potentially could be true, and I'm here in person, and... Uh, to be honest with you, yeah, this is going to be um, last week's episode. Actually, is going to be one of our last episodes where we're doing this from afar, which is exciting. As yeah, man, I actually am. I um, I signed a deal a couple of weeks ago with a company, a corporation here in Minneapolis that actually brings me back from Milwaukee back into the Twin Cities. So officially, I will be moved back here, and by back here, I mean literally in this house with you. Uh, on Friday um, as I start my new venture and I, I really wanted to let everybody know this uh, for a couple different reasons because I I know how this is going to go. Uh, people are going to find out that I'm back in Minnesota. People are going to find out I'm back in the Twin Cities and then I'm going to get phone calls or texts or, or Facebook messages or whatever it might be saying, Rennie, uh, you know, can we book you for this show or you should show up at this event and I, I get those still from time to time. And I stepped out of the ring on March 28th last year at Primetime Wrestling. I lost a match that says, hey, if I lost that match, I can't compete there anymore. And I'm going to stick to that. Uh, Will I be at wrestling shows? Yes, I will be at wrestling shows in the Twin Cities. I will be there probably with you sometimes doing some podcasting stuff for this. Um, But I will not be there in any sort of capacity where I'm going to be competing inside of a ring for a couple of reasons. Uh, My new venture uh, in, in life 
as far as what I'm doing professionally outside of pro wrestling, I obviously have to maintain a certain standard of professionalism with that role. Um, and, you know, at, at this point, that's kind of where my main focus is. Obviously, I, I love this podcast. I love doing this with you every week, and we're going to c- continue to do this every week and uh, continue to watch wrestling. And I guess my main focus moving forward is when I'm at these shows, I'm there as sort of a resource for some of these guys. Um, for those of you, if this is the first time listening to the show, Uh, My background is I was and am a professional wrestler, first first and foremost, more than anything else. I spent 11 years in the business. I've worked for WWE. I've worked for some of the major independent promotions in Minnesota. Um, And something that you people might not know is I also have a master's degree in business. So um, not any sort of knock on any independent wrestler, but most independent wrestlers don't have an advanced education past high school. Uh, I did. I have a backup plan, and I'm utilizing it in my professional life. But you know, if you ask me why, you know, what kind of qualifications do I have to do a podcast? Because it seems like everybody and their brother is doing a podcast nowadays about pro wrestling. Um, you know, I lived it for 11 years, and I'm still living it. And I have a uh, an advanced degree in business, so I can look at both sides of the swords, I guess, on pro wrestling. Um, but my main focus when I come back here is obviously putting in a lot of time in this podcast with you. We have a lot of awesome guests coming up that we're going to talk about here shortly. Uh, but if you see me at a show and you're you're a worker or you're a wrestler of any any sort, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask me for advice or ask me to watch your match because that's how I got better. You know, I asked the veterans when I was there, say, hey, can you watch my match and give me advice on things that I can do better or what can I improve on? You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to tell you no. You know, I'm not going to say absolutely not. I'm there as a resource. Like I said, I've contacted promoters and I said, hey, I want to come in. Maybe I'll record a podcast. We'll record a podcast before the show, but we're going to stick around for the show, have a couple beers, and really be there to provide feedback for the young, up and coming talent in wrestling. Um, there's a lot of good workers in Minnesota. So obviously they can help you too, but a lot of times they're busy doing their own thing. They don't have a chance to watch your match. I'll be there, whether it be in the crowd or in the back. Uh, watching your match and trying to give you any sort of feedback that I can. So, and if you're my fans and you want me back in the ring, I appreciate it. I get that quite a bit. Um, you know, keep supporting. You know, the podcast is the best way to support me. And um, you know, if you see me at a show, obviously say hi and, and whatnot. But so you'll see me on shows. I'm excited to see the guys again. I'm excited to be back here with you. I can uh, definitely guarantee to the listening audience that there's going to be a lot of alcohol consumption uh, between you and I, probably. Um, and there'll also be a, a live version of Monday Night Raw. I think we'll be able to attend next week. Yeah, that is a good point. WWE is coming to Minneapolis next week for Raw. Are you... I mean, I'm looking forward to the show. I went to SmackDown in September, uh, but I've heard some a couple things as far as, like, the Raw before Christmas sometimes is kind of a big stinking pile of shit. To be yeah, honest it'll, with yeah it'll, be, it'll be awful, but I'll be there. It'll be a terrible show. I mean, Hogan's but, dressing up as Santa. Yeah. Ho, ho, Hogan. It's going to suck. Ho, it's, ho, Hogan. Uh, well, okay, well, we know that's going to be bad, but that's next week. How about this past week? We had NXT R Evolution on Thursday. We had TLC on Sunday. We had Monday Night Raw. What is your... You want to just start this with a, yeah, what's I mean, your takeaway on the week in general? It was a big week. It might be too much stuff to break down everything, but what'd you have? What'd you have for this week as your big takeaway? You know, it's a lot of wrestling, and as, as we're recording this right now, we're watching SmackDown Live. So, I mean, we had NXT on Thursday, TLC on Sunday, Raw Monday, SmackDown the main event on Tuesday. That's a lot of pro wrestling in five days. You know. Um, my main takeaway is I very much enjoyed NXT. I for anytime I see good wrestling, whether it's a WWE produced product or it could be Impact, it could be uh, Ring of Honor, it could be you know PWG out in California, it could be whatever it is. You know, good wrestling is I'm a big fan of that. So NXT from top to bottom filled two hours of wrestling, and every match I felt um, gave us something different. The only thing, if I'm going to critique it from a wrestling standpoint, there was way too many dives on the show because we've seen a dive after a dive after a dive. But uh, my main takeaway from NXT, uh, obviously the main event is going to be talked about by a lot of people. I know you really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Sasha Banks and Charlotte. And I think I enjoyed it so much because we aren't accustomed to seeing really good Divas matches. And when I broke into the business 11 years ago, those there were girls on the indie scene that would main event indie shows that were really, really good at at wrestling and so seeing Charlotte and Sasha Banks on Thursday work that match and work it almost to perfection was very refreshing to see from a wrestling fan standpoint um, coming from me as far as my takeaway from NXT I know I you didn't watch NXT live and I was texting you and I said dude you need to watch this it's it's fucking awesome 
and you said I'll watch it tomorrow or whatever and, and, and we kind of talk about this a little bit later with Justin too about your kind of take on some of the NXT rosters but you know if you give it a, a 1 to 10 rating where are you rating the 2 hour special? I thought it was a good, I thought it was a very good show. I'd probably have it sit right in that seven range. I was I was excited to watch it. I've seen Sami Zayn. I've seen Adrian Neville. I knew that they were going to put on a show, and that's that's a match that's worth watching for anybody that enjoys wrestling or that knows either of those guys. I thought that was fantastic. Some of the other stuff I thought was good, not great, but a great main event can make up for anything bad early on. I told you this and. I talked a little bit about it later in our show. We're going to hear about it from Justin, some of his take on it. I don't see guys in NXT that I think are main roster guys. I don't know if that's just me. I don't know if maybe I just can't see past some of the things that I'm seeing on the screen. I love Sami Zayn. I love Adrian Neville. I told you, if I could say one guy that I thought, hey, this guy kind of grabs my eye as a as just an outside viewer like I am, somebody that hasn't wrestled, hasn't been in the in between the ropes for a legitimate match in my life, I thought Baron Corbin's a guy who just grabbed my eye. But he also, he's out there for 15 seconds every match. So that was just something that kind of surprised me, I thought. Whenever I watched it expecting to see an unbelievable show, I thought I might take away 8, 9, 10 guys that I'd be like, oh, I can't wait for them to get up. I think a lot of them might be exactly where they need to be right now in that small environment, small arena, same same crowd every night going around the country. I don't know if that's going to be where you see a lot of those guys in the future. Yeah, you make a good point. Baron Corbin's kind of your your typical WWE main roster guy though, like body build, you know, big dude, tall. A lot of their talents as great of a pro wrestler as they are they're all very similar in body size and adrian neville and we did allude to this with justin is very small as far as height wise goes and he's very flippy floppy very good wrestler i just don't know if he's got a place in the main roster and i i don't like to be negative about it because people are like well daniel bryan won the world title well daniel bryan's an exception to the rule you're not going to have if you saturate the WWE with 15 daniel bryan's you know, it's gonna it's gonna change your perception. I think so. NXT is very good wrestling product. WWE is an entertainment product. It's not fair to compare the two. And I alluded to that later too. I hate it when people are, are like, oh, "I'm just gonna watch NXT from now on, and not Raw." Well, they're two different. They're com- they're completely two different products. They are completely different. You know, Raw started 23 minutes with a, a promo. Again, an opening promo that lasted 23 minutes on Raw. Oh, God, you're not gonna you're not gonna <laughs> NXT, especially a special. NXT does four specials a year. You can't compare that to Raw. You can compare an XT special to a pay-per-view potentially. Um, but yeah, Raw started with a 23-minute opening promo with Jericho. Um, I, you know, They accomplished a couple things from it, but I don't think any promo needs to take up one-sixth of the show. You know, I mean, I just think that's too much talking. So, so now that we've jumped into Raw, if we're... We don't want to skip TLC. No, we'll, we'll get to TLC. It's, it's just I need to mention uh, that 23, 23 of the first 23 minutes were spent on a promo with a part-time wrestler, Chris Jericho, which let, uh, I'll jump into it. Seeing Lesnar and Jericho in the ring later in the show was awesome. I thought that was cool. Uh, Lesnar completely kicked the shit out of him, which exactly should have happened. Um, it's Okay, so TLC was... Let's just say, call it what it was. It was not a good pay-per-view, or a, it was not a good network I think special. Both of, I think both of us expected better. We expected better because there was nine matches with the pre-show, and the matches on paper should, I mean, they seemed legit good. Now, I'm going to say a couple things. The opening ladder match was phenomenal. I thought it was very, very well done, very good. It was cool. I mean, we saw blood, right? We don't get to see that very often, and there was legit staples put in Luke Harper's head, and... Uh, they, I mean, they, they busted their ass like that brass ring comment from Vince McMahon like it I think was ringing in their ears from the beginning of that bell to the end of it I've told you and I've told this podcast Dolph Ziggler's my guy I love that guy I love watching him whether he's at the beginning of the show end of the show middle of the show I think he's a very entertaining wrestler and he's done nothing but impress me and pretty much everybody that's been watching WWE TV for the last three months I would say he's he was from Cleveland. He came out to the crowd. Everybody loved him. What is the reason? If you're not going to put Cena and Rollins on last, which I'd, I'm not, I'm okay with that. I'm not. I'm okay with that not going on last. But if you're going to, and I alluded to this today when we spoke about it, 
it's almost like the guys who are writing TLC aren't the same people that are writing Raw, and vice versa. I don't know, there's just a disconnect between the shows, mostly because the main event at TLC was who? The Riot, Dean Ambrose TLC match. They weren't on TV for a minute on Raw, and they were the main event. So, if you're going to have Ziggler go over in a, in the best match of the night, which anybody probably could have guessed that prior to the show, that that's going to be the match of the night because the fans are going to be behind him. It's going to be a ladder match. Ziggler's going to be basically channeling his inner, inner Shawn Michaels. It's going to be amazing. If you're not going to put Cena and Rollins on last, then why don't you open the show with Bray Wyatt and Dean Ambrose and let everybody forget about him for two hours and then end the show with with Dolph Ziggler. That way, it at least can explain why you're not going to push you're not going to push Ambrose and Wyatt the next night on Raw. If you're, if you're going to close the, t- the TLC pay-per-view with them, how are they not going to get on TV the next night? I agree for the fact that they weren't on TV enough for Raw. Did they have to close the paper? Okay, the most important match at TLC was the tables match because there was a... Basically, the number one contendership was on the line for John Cena to lose it. Okay, but you can't have a T, you can't have just a straight tables match follow a TLC match if we're going to have all three. So I get that's why they closed the show with a TLC match. Here's something, WWE. Typically, when you have a TLC match, there's this thing called a title hanging above the ring that would represent why there needs to be a ladder in the first place. To have a TLC match for the sake of a TLC match with no title on the line. Is just fucking stupid. It, it Isn't that just a street fight? Yeah, I mean, it's basically a no-holds-barred match. You know, I mean, they, they, everybody knows that there's tables, ladders, and chairs in the ring at all times. I mean, we've seen it on Raw, for Christ's sake. So, you look at some of the best TLC matches in history, all right, Hardy Boys, Edge and Christian, Dudley Boys, tag team titles were hanging above this ring, right? I mean, there's always a, a title. Now, if there was a title hanging above the ring, the TLC match would have made more sense, and it would have also made more sense to close the show with it. I get it. You're not going to have a TLC match with these two workers and have Johnson and Seth Rollins try to put somebody through a table as the gimmick and, and overdo three gimmicks in the match. Okay, that makes sense, but like you said, yes. you got to, for fuck's sake, I mean, John Cena should have been the main focal point on Raw. He was. John Cena and Brock Lesnar, by far. But to not even really allude to Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt, other than the fact that they are going to be in the same building tonight for SmackDown Live, right? Were were they not in the same building last night? Were we supposed to be led to believe that they weren't? I mean, there they are again, like, just, I mean, it is what it is, but, um, you know, we're on the subject of that. The tables match I thought was really well done. I thought, you know, we had match, we had a stairs match, a tables match, a ladders match, a chairs match, and a TLC match. Out of those matches, the chairs match was the worst match between Kane and Ryback. Uh, and I know I don't want to get on a tangent on Kane because you could care less about him, as, as could I. But if the authority is no longer around on TV, is there a reason that we have corporate Kane anymore? Who is he corporate for? I don't believe that that makes sense, no. I don't, I don't understand why he has to wear the dress pants, but that's if I had to... Have you ever seen this movie, Seen and Evil? <laughs> no, I have not. You've never seen it? No. All right, you should check out Cena Weevil because the character he plays is Jacob Goodnight. That's his name in the movie. And it's like a horror film character. Why not? Hear me out, people. Kane's, Kane's character right now is stale as fuck. So why not have him be Jacob Goodnight on WB programming and team with Ray Wyatt? I mean, it would be cool, but then you don't want to take that opportunity away for them to give him that sweet rub that he got by beating up Adam Rose and the bunny on Monday night. So that, that was a big rub for Kane to get. Give him a fucking pop because he gave the bunny a goddamn tombstone. I mean, yeah, I was happy to see it too, but that crowd went nuts. So, And now tonight he was supposed to, I mean, tonight on SmackDown Live or on Raw or something, he wrestles Rowan, I think, next week on Raw, right? Is that, I mean, it's just... The booking is, and they got six weeks till Rumble, so they can do whatever the fuck they want. I mean, it's their product. We're gonna we're gonna tune in every week, regardless. Yeah, uh, we are. It, this we is what are. it is. Um, but the tables match I thought was great. I thought they used the gimmick well. A table, um, the spot with the ref being out and both of them going through the tables at the same time was something different. We hadn't seen anything like that in a while. Um, gave a chance for Roman Reigns to come back and look extremely strong leading in the Royal Rumble. It pr- still protected Seth Rollins, I think. I was. Were you at all surprised? Did you get the feeling when you were watching it that Reigns was coming, or did you? I was still. I was still thinking we were gonna see Randy Orton's return until I, I Reigns kinda, came out. I kind of thought Orton as well, uh, but now I don't think we see Orton until Royal Rumble. No, um, I wouldn't think so. You know, I don't think he comes. And then uh, we had some interesting take on Orton 
coming up later with Justin Labar, which I'm a fan of. So I'll, I'll let that kind of hang out there for you guys to think about. I don't know. I mean, I know we're kind of across the board tonight, but there's just been so much wrestling. Like, okay, we can agree. NXT was, was great. NXT was the best wrestling show I watched out of all these, okay? TLC, with nine matches, with NXT just coming off one of their better showings of all time, the talent at TLC, I thought, outside of the opener, outside of the tables match, and even outside the TLC match, could have done so much more. The one thing that the TLC's card could have done is save me from having to buy you a bottle of alcohol. I went, I went eight and one. I, eight and one. I, I think I ended six and three. No, you went, you went seven, seven and two. two. Seven and two. Because you not good enough. I mean, you picked Big Show. No, you picked Rowan over Big Show, and I went Big Show because I didn't think it made sense. And I'm, obviously, I'm right because I'm a fucking genius. But speaking of that match, okay, a lot of people on Twitter kind of shit on that match. Uh, I'm not saying this because I'm a huge fan of Eric Rowan and because I uh, I think he's a, a cool dude. The match was a stairs match. They used the stairs a lot in that match. If the gimmick is the stairs, you need to sell the gimmick and you need to use it as much as possible. They did that. You and I both know Big Show's limited in what he can do. Okay, Eric Rowan is still a big dude. He's not the absolute best wrestler in the world. He knows that, but he does what he can, given his you know, given what he's good at. Now when you're you're in there with Big Show. You're extremely limited what you can do. So they pretty much had to beat the hell out of each other with stairs. Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a problem with the finish of the match. I didn't have a problem with the match in general at all. No, I, no, it, it was what it was. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't I, Adrian Neville, Sami Zayn. No, and but it, I mean, that and, did that. No, and you should expect to not get that. If you think you're going to get that, then don't don't log in for that match anyway. Which I'd say the same thing about the Kane and Ryback match. I mean, that was. I mean, they, okay, Kane and Ryback was fucking awful though. They could have done something better. I, okay, I I will go to bat for a lot of these guys. But holy shit, okay, I, I do, I like Glenn Jacobs, Kane, I, I like him as a, as a person, as a character, his character stale shit, but that match went out in the middle of that ring, in the middle of Cleveland, Ohio, and took a big shit right in the middle of the ring. It didn't help, it didn't help the show, I'm not gonna lie to you. No, it did, I mean, it, it was a transition match for the main event, what, to, to have the people sit on their hands so they could save their focal cords for the last match? And by the way, speaking of the last match, kudos to those guys because they had to sit through a fucking three and a half hour, you know, two and a half hours or two hour, three hours of wrestling that already saw ladders, that already saw chairs, and already saw tables. And now they have to follow it up in the main. That's tough, man. That's tough to try to get that crowd on their feet. And I thought, you know, you could tell they were tired. You could tell that they, they really needed to try to do something different to get that crowd back up. And we talked about this with Justin, and I, I, don't, I didn't get your take on it because you fell asleep like a bitch and spilled your beer all over you. But, I mean, we, we, I mean, you can check out Twitter. It's Pencil Podcast. There's a picture of this idiot falling asleep, dead as fuck, on the couch. But the TV exploded on Dean, Dean Ambrose, and that was the finish. There's a lot of people that hated it. I thought, okay. They alluded to the TV a little bit earlier in the match. He, crank, he yanked on the TV one time. It didn't come undone. The second time he yanked on it, it came undone and blew up in his face. It looked real. I mean, it was realistic, right? Like, if you're going to yank a fucking TV out of, a, out of a, a wall or something, there's potential that thing can spark in your face. Yeah, I, I, did, I don't have a serious issue with it. I mean, I didn't see it because I was sleeping, but it, was, it, seemed, it seemed like an interesting finish when I read about it the next day. I mean, it's. It, I mean, yeah, okay, this is how good you thought the pay per view was, man. You just you sit on your couch. I mean, okay, I'll give you. A, it was a Sunday, so you're watching football all day. You're drinking beers. I don't know if you're chewing, but you're falling asleep. You're you're passed out on your couch. I get a text from uh, your roommate, and it will now be my roommate at the time. And he's you're you're passed out with a full beer in your hand. And the next text I get is a picture of that seat that dirt is no longer sitting in, but there is a wet spot. All over the seat, and at first I thought, well, Jesus Christ, did he either piss his pants or come in his pants? What did he do? And you, you spilt the beer all over you. That's how bad TLC was to you. That was, it, was, it was really frustrating for me. I love my couch, and it's one of my favorite places to be, and I've been cleaning it for two and a half days. It was beer. It was a Paps Blue Ribbon, to be exact, and it was a tough time for me, but I've gotten past it. TLC did not keep me awake, obviously, but... We got into Monday Night Raw, and we finally got to see Brock Lesnar return, which I was excited about. 23 minutes. 23 minutes to start the fucking show. And, okay, I still, okay, Jericho does a good job being entertaining. Paul Heyman's fantastic. Just too many people in one segment. Overall, three hours of Raw. Um, I'm just trying to think of, like, the, ma- the match between Seth Rollins and John Cena was great. It was very good. It was okay. very good. How did you feel after watching Raw? about the way that they brought back Lesnar because I think that that should be 
the focus of WWE for the last couple months is how are we going to bring this beast back? They had months to plan it, and this is what they decided. How did you think they did? I thought you should have cleared the house of both of them, to be honest with you. But they have a plan long term now with Seth Rollins. Is Seth Rollins a new Paul Heyman guy? I don't know. They shook hands. To be honest, I mean, if I'm you, or if I'm Brock Lesnar and some dude stomps my head into the fucking mat and tries to cash in his title, I don't care what anybody tries to tell me, whether it be Paul Heyman or somebody else, I'm going to try to knock that dude's block off. And he walked in there and he f 5 the shit out of John Cena, left him laying, Seth Rollins pinned him, shook hands with Seth Rollins or gave him a nod or whatever the hell that was, walked out. So unless this is some sort of big plan for Lesnar to get back at Rollins, which I think is exactly what's going to happen, um, I, I don't know. You know, I, I was hoping he was going to come out and just clear house. Yeah, and I think that that would have been much better. I didn't like the start of Lesnar coming back, meaning him coming out with Jericho in the middle of the ring. I just Jericho doesn't really do it for me that much anymore, and he doesn't feel like a big enough star or just a big enough person in stature in general for me to think that... Lesnar needs to waste his time with him, basically. But he's bigger than some random dude on the roster, probably. Like Big, I mean, bigger, than, a bigger name than some random dude on the roster, like Roman Reigns, who was probably going to beat Brock Lesnar in yeah, four he's months. Not, he's not going to do that to Roman Reigns. I mean, you pick I, somebody I, from the, pick I somebody would. I would. I, I think that'd be unbelievable. I would rather have him. I would. I think it's more beneficial for Brock Lesnar's character to take out Chris Jericho than it would be to take out a Sheamus or a Big E Langston. You know, I, I just yeah. think you know Jericho's name is still a marquee name. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably. I'm not, right. I'm not probably right. I'm. I'm right, right. right. I'm 100 percent right. right. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I was fine with that booking, and now we won't see Jericho again probably for, I don't know, two weeks, And I we, guess. Won't, we won't see Lesnar until the go-home show of Raw before Rumble, probably? Or maybe the first first Raw in January? At first, I thought it was cool, man. I thought it was sweet. Like, yeah, this guy's going to take things, you know, take a bunch of pay-per-views off. Uh, a lot of pay-per-views, actually. A lot, uh, he's, a been lot off, of he's been off since Night of Champions. So, uh, and a bunch of the mid-card guys got to step up, but... It's missing the champion now, man. You can really feel it. Like even last night, I think last night when he came out, the crowd wanted to cheer a lot. But I didn't. I think they're kind of resenting him a little bit too. Like, okay, hey, it's awesome to see you, Lesnar. But for fuck's sake, man, you know, be here. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's the feeling I got, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's about right. And but other than that, is there any other takeaways from Raw that you thought were positive and or negative? It wasn't a great show. The main event was pretty good. Not a great show. Uh, one thing that I wanted to touch on is the Divas Tag Team match. And the only reason I want to touch on this is uh, it was a Tag Team match, so we look at where people stand in the ring for Tag Team matches, right? The Bella Twins were on the corner. Um, I guess their faces were facing the hard cam, and it was uh, Alicia Fox and Natalia had their backs to the hard cam. Wrong. Okay, that's wrong, and and here's why. And, and people, I've got I've asked this question: Is typically in a tag team match or a six man tag or a Survivor Series match, whatever it might be, why do the faces stand in the corner to the left, the upper left corner? It's extremely simple, and and they, I don't know why that in that match they didn't do it, but you're supposed to. The camera catches the facial expressions of the of the face team, so. John Cena's great at this. When John Cena is going to be ready for the hot tag, you can see him jumping up and down. You can see his face like fighting for the guy in the ring, fighting for the guy who's been taking the heat the entire time. And that facial expression, because you can see it on the camera as a viewer from home, because those live shows are not catered to the people who pay 70 bucks a ticket. They're, they're catered to the people who sit at home and watch it for free. So they're making, they're making sure that we, the viewer on TV, can see the facial expressions so we can kind of feel it emotionally you know, and, and be there right there with John Cena waiting for that hot tag. We can see his facial expressions, and we're excited. And once he gets a hot tag, we can jump out of our seats and cheer, yay, Cena, or whatever the hell you want to do. That's the reason the faces stand in that corner is just so that way the facial expression. And if you watch a match, too, you'll see a lot of times when somebody takes a bump or you know, a move happens or whatever happens, you'll see that they immediately turn and look to the hard cam, so that way you can see that facial expression, because you are really, um, obviously, you're wrestling for the TV audience, not not so much the live audience. So when you, when you buy that ticket to go to, for instance, on Raw on Monday, when we buy our tickets to go to Raw on Monday, if we get a ticket to the hard cam side, you know, their backs are always to us because they're facing the hard cam. So if you get a ticket on the hard cam, or the hard cam is actually stationed, you actually get a better show. And most people don't know that. So uh, unless you are really sold and need to be on TV for whatever reason, you know, then get that ticket. And that's probably where we're going to be sitting as well. So Monday Night Raw, 
in Minneapolis. It's going to be awesome. I'm actually going to be on Extreme Pro Wrestling Radio, hopefully, before Raw starts while I wait for you guys to show up. Um, not sure where we're going to sit yet. We're going to get tickets there, but we'll be there. So if you guys see us, we'll be tweeting from at Pencil Podcast. Um, it'll be me, you, and, and probably another guy or two. So it should be fun. It's, it'll be your first live event since the Raw After Mania. Right? Yes, it will be. Yes, it will be. Um, it'll be my first event since the SmackDown show I went to. Uh, I am anticipating a complete shit of a show, to be complete. Uh, and I don't mean being drunk. I just mean it's going to be awful. I don't think it's going to be good. Correct. Um, it's, it's before Christmas, but we'll, we'll be there anyway. We'll be, there. be there. It's we'll, in we'll town. Yeah, what type of professional duty would we be doing to this podcast if we don't go to Monday not, Raw? Not, we wouldn't be doing a very goddamn good one. Not good not good enough but hey uh, as we let you go as we let you guys go um tribute to the troops is tomorrow night for the wwe on the usa network it's actually one of the coolest shows of the year we got bray wyatt and uh dean ambrose, dean ambrose is tomorrow so uh for the troops so good for them check that out obviously um smackdown lives on right now but coming up next week we have a local independent referee rob page on the show and the reason why i'm bringing rob on is because i think most people don't have an appreciation for what a referee means to a wrestling match um after rob page on the on the 30th of December, we have Lance Archer from New Japan Pro Wrestling. He was just booked in Nate Man Tag for the Wrestle Kingdom 9 show at the Tokyo Dome. The following week after that, January 6th, is Destination, or I guess Impact Wrestling's Ken Anderson, Mr. Anderson, is going to be on the show. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we don't have any guests after that solidified yet, uh, but here's some names that will be appearing on the show coming up that we've talked to. They're just waiting on dates. Uh, mean Gene Oakland. From the WWE, WCW, Legends House. If you don't know who Mean Gene is, you're crazy. The greatest backstage interviewer of all time. Uh, Jimmy Corderas, who is a former WWE referee, also had the unfortunate duty of being in the ring the night Owen Hart fell in Kansas City. Uh, he actually writes about that in his book. Uh, we also have coming up a, the the analyst, Alex Riley, from the WWE. Uh, free Riley, free Alex Riley. So he's going to come on, and then we're going to talk about that a little bit. So um, as I mentioned, he's awesome at doing the pre-show, so I'm sure he'll come on here and do a fantastic job with us. But he probably should be back in the ring. He's uh, he's a body guy. He needs to be in the ring. So have a lot of exciting, a lot of exciting people coming up, and we're going to keep trying to bring you guys more and more people every week. Uh, and, and do the best job that we can do. And if, again, we suck, let us know. And Travis sucks. He's at Travis Mester. If I suck, I'm at Real Renny D. Our Twitter is at Pencil Podcast, PencilPodcast.com. We're on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, Stitcher. Episode 20, that's a wrap. Anything you want to say, Dirt? Not a thing. Not a damn thing. Until next week, Ref Rob Page. We'll see you then. Hey, Dave, Dave, what do you get when an atheist and a Christian start a podcast i don't know ken what do you get when a christian and an atheist start a podcast i don't know i don't know you're the freaking comedian i figured you'd have some kind of joke or something <laughs> right hi i'm david vox mullen and i'm mr anderson seriously wait for it just just wait for it anderson and we're the hosts of Push the Button on the DVM Podcast Empire. It's a show where we discuss religion, politics, and sex. All that stuff that we're not supposed to talk about. I am a Christian. And I'm an ordained minister with the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. I think that's code for he's an atheist. And together, we tackle any and every hot-button issue that the world is scared to talk about. Yeah, we're not afraid of the truth. Yeah, we're not afraid to piss people off. And we're not afraid to push the button. So find us on iTunes. Or simply visit us online at dvmpe.com. And God willing, you'll come back for more. Uh, yeah, God willing. That's, that's, uh, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, Dave. The Pencils kicking off the new year with their biggest podcast yet. On January 6th, we will officially kick off Destination Impact. We are available on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. Find us online at PencilPodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at PencilPodcast as we welcome former TNA World Heavyweight Champion, Hey, this is Chris with Spot Monkey Media. Are you a professional wrestler, a promoter, a business owner? Spot Monkey Media offers creative media solutions for your brand or business. 
whether it's merchandise design or promotional material for your next event. Spot Monkey Media will work hands-on to bring your ideas to life. Spot Monkey Media, create your legacy. Get a free high five when you mention this podcast. Connect with us on Twitter at Spot Monkey Media. You've been listening to another great episode of The Pencil, a professional wrestling podcast coming straight at you every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. But hang around, we got a lot more to come because up next is the guest of the evening. We dive right into the world of professional wrestling, asking all the questions that you want answers to. Up next. All right, so we are sitting here with Justin Labar from WrestleZone.com, and actually on top of WrestleZone.com, he writes for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, has his own reality TV show, and, and by that I mean it's Chair Shot Reality, and you also do a, a podcast yourself or a radio show as well, is that right, Justin? Yeah, the uh, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, their um, their parent company is Trib Total Media, so I do, the as you said, the columns for um, the paper, do two wrestling columns for the paper, and then they, they actually own a sports radio station, so... Uh, you know why not do a, a a radio show each week and yeah that that's also podcasted for a download. Nice man. I mean you must have been the last week here <laughs> wrestling wise. You've got to have been extremely busy. NXT on Thursday. You had indie shows all weekend. Stuff with Matt Hardy going on. Obviously TLC on Sunday. Raw yesterday. Um, are you able to kind of catch your breath now and catch up on everything going on in the world of wrestling? I'm trying, yeah. Because even even with Raw last night, I, I <laughs> this just shows you how bad my 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 scheduling can be. I uh. I got back in town uh, Monday f- from from the indie shows that you mentioned, and um, and then I had forgot. Well, I didn't forget, but it wasn't planned this this well. I had uh, I had to do a Monday Night Raw viewing party uh, at a bar last night, so I had to go to a bar to watch Raw with all these people. And That's drink, right. You know, which, which I, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's not it's not. I shouldn't be complaining, but I had a good time. But it was just like the last thing I wanted. To, all I wanted to do was just rest. But uh, the, uh, the, the 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 wrestling party continued. So. Yeah, do you do that? I see you do that once in a great while for raw viewings, and do you do that for pay per view viewings as well? Uh, yeah, I do them for raw. I, I do them. I usually try to do one in Pittsburgh once every month or two, and then I've been fortunate. You know, New York and a lot of different cities are starting to bring me to there. Um, if, they, if you know, if somebody has a bar or whatever, and uh, and 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 I'm thankful that you know it helped me be in there. I guess helps bring people out, and people, you know, wrestling fans love to gather and watch, so they'll do that, and I'll do like a little bit of commentary during the commercials, and fans always have fun with that. So. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I don't do it much for pay per views anymore, especially with the network now. It just you know that kind of that kind of took that that sale away because people can watch. You know, people it's it's hard to convince people to come out want to pay you know want to pay at a bar to drink and eat or whatever when they could sit at home potentially and watch it. So, uh, but yeah, I, I enjoy doing it. It's fun. It's it's if for nothing else. It's it's uh it's just a good good PR thing. Good to meet fans and and just just talk wrestling. Right. You know, I mean, the days of the blast arenas are over. I don't even know if you can go to WWE.com and, and look for them anymore with the network. I'm pretty sure they're non-existent. Um, you've been involved in professional wrestling one way, shape, or form or another for quite a while. Obviously, you wrote for Bleacher Report for a while, and now you're the lead editor of WrestleZone.com. Can you just give our listeners, if maybe they're not too familiar with you, a little background on you and when you got started in pro, pro wrestling and I guess how? Well, Ryan, I do want to I do want to correct you just just because this is actually a common misconception, and I just it's only fair for me to to fix it. Um, I'm actually sure. I'm actually with WrestleZone. I'm actually not the lead editor or anything. People, I, and I and I take it as a compliment when people think when people, especially when they say it in a nice way, uh, when they think that WrestleZone is like my site or whatever. And uh, uh, Nick Paglino is actually the editor. I I literally my um my involvement is kind of at this point has just gotten Crave Media, which owns WrestleZone. I, uh, I I I produce and and control and own the property of Chair Shot Reality, the, the talk show. Okay. And I do that, and I supply that form, and that's that's kind of yeah, that's kind of where I'm leaving it at. I, I've kind of stepped away from any, um, you know, you know, news reporting, and I, I never was the editor. So I just I people always kind of have that misconception, uh, which again I, I say thanks if if that's I mean if it's a compliment, but I just want to uh, uh, just you know clarify that. But um, yeah, that's no, awesome. no, yeah, no, with wrestling, uh, yeah, it's been. It's been a lifelong thing. Um, you know, like everybody, obviously, just I remember being really young. I, I, people think I'm crazy, but I, I'm dead serious. I was three years old. I can remember. Um, yeah, my mom was very, very young when she had me. So, uh, uh, you know, um, she she worked for the police. So, you know, she worked a lot of crazy hours. So anything she could do to keep me entertained was was good. And uh, and I, I stumbled upon wrestling. And, man, I just was drawn into that. And, and then I, a couple years later, my um, – uh, as, as, as people might have read or, or, or what have you, my grandfather started working a lot with um, 
uh, what they call spot shows, you know, a lot of indies basically, yep. you know, just, um, you know, and I, and obviously this time we're talking now we're talking, you know, early to mid nineties. Um, so business was starting to get hot going as, you know, obviously there's just a lot more talent that was out there and more, more wrestling all around. And, um, so in Maryland, um, whether it be with Maryland championship wrestling or just these independent shows, he would help uh, these promoters with the promoting and with logistics and all the all the yings and yangs that go into it. And uh, one of the main one of the main roles that he always had um, was kind of like they on the day show talent relations to where like if 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 if, uh, if, if George Animal Steel was was on the show and he would he would go and pick George up at the airport and 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 take him to the hotel and take him to the venue. And so like I got to tag along with all this and not only to see these guys these larger than life guys you know right there in the car, but you know I got to. I not necessarily necessarily realize it, but I got to see a lot more of the business side of things than you know obviously most you know kids would, and it just it kind of just kept it just kind of kept me reassured that I wanted to work in that in in that genre um, somehow some way and uh, never let go of that dream you know I went to college I moved to Pittsburgh to to get my degree in uh, in television at Point Park University which which I did and uh, while I was in college I went back down to DC um, DC and Maryland where I grew up I went back down there for summer to intern at a radio station for a morning show and that morning and that radio station happened to be one of the stations that WWE used when they come to town. And, um, and long story short, I ended up networking. I ended up getting to go on the road with WWE production and shadowing, um, uh, you know, shadowing how they did live TV raw. And, 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 and I, it was actually funny just before you, just before we, just before you guys called me, I was, um, looking and Zach Ryder just, um, Instagrammed a photo. Uh, and it was a photo from the Armageddon where, he and Kurt Hawkins were like the were they were the, they were with Edge they were revealed to be with Edge and they were dressed just like them yeah. and everything and that was that why I was there with WWE production at that event I will never forget that um, so you know that just gave me another, again another kind of glance of uh, the business and learning more and, and everything and then um, after college uh, again the crazy world of wrestling and, and small world or whatever uh, uh, Crave Media who owns WrestleZone had got a hold of me and that that kind of then birthed Chair Shot and then that led to the radio show with the trip and that led to bleach report and that led to, you know, just, it just kept snowballing and just been, uh, it's been fun, been very fortunate, very fun. Yeah, dude. I mean, for you to work in the industry first of broadcast journalism or journalism in general and in professional wrestling uh, is pretty awesome. And given the fact that those are two things that you really focused on, I'm kind of a similar, I wrote a paper when I was five years old, said I wanted to be a professional wrestler. I wanted to be like Bret Hart. Started when I was 16, worked for 11 years, and uh, here I am. Now I run a podcast uh, like a lot of people, but hopefully bringing a little bit different perspective since I've actually been hands-on involved in the business for the past 11 years. You know, and, and you mentioned you kind of did this in college. I, I think about the NXT tapings at full sale and how a lot of the production and even some of the camera crew are students of that university. And, and speaking of NXT, you know, on that subject – Thursday's NXT special is getting a lot of praise from everybody on the internet. I love the show. I thought from top to bottom it was extremely solid. What were your What was your general takeaway from Thursday's NXT? It was uh, Takeover Revolution, right? Or our evolution is what they actually named it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a lot of hype going into it. I was really excited for it. I, I'm just like I said, you know, I'm one of those people that I buzz and real, real interested in NXT. Uh, I did a media call the day before with Triple H actually, and. Um, which I was live tweeting, and I think there's audio of it out there somewhere. And so I got to sit and um, BS with him about NXT, and and and, 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 he, and he hit the nail on the head so much with with the the, the positives about it. And uh, you know, I, I love it because it's like a it's kind of like an indie show with a million dollar budget. You know, it's that small intimate crowd. Yeah. It's the same crowd. Um, you know, Thursday show. I, I'll be honest, I didn't got to, I have not got to yet watch everything start to finish. Um, uh, that was the start of, uh, of uh, what's been the crazy week. I did get to see, I got to see uh, the opening Kevin Owens match. I got to see the uh, most, um, uh, I got I got to see the Finn Balor entrance and most of that match. I got to see, I got to see part of the Sami Zayn uh, Neville match. I haven't got to watch the the Charlotte Sasha Banks unfortunately yet. Um, but but what I what I saw of it, what I've grabbed, I, it just you know they. It, it, it's somewhat of a PR line, but it, it's it's actually kind of true. Like you know. Hunter kept saying he's like you know he doesn't really he doesn't really look so much at NXT anymore as developmental but more so almost like just an alternate brand which you know it is still developmental we know that but he he does have a point it's definitely almost like it's definitely almost like manufactured competition whether they want it to be or not because right now the fans are you know literally if they're they're watching NXT and they're watching Raw 
And it's almost like they're watching two totally different things because of the two different looks and the two different feels. And uh, right now, NXT is uh, winning the quote-unquote ratings war, it feels like. <laughs> yeah, I see. I get a lot of that on Twitter, especially last night watching Raw, and people would compare Raw to NXT, which I don't think is a fair comparison no, uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, Raw is three hours weekly, 52 weeks a year. I mean, obviously, NXT is every Thursday, but they're filling uh, – was an hour or two hours on Thursday. I mean – I think it'd be more fair to compare the NXT specials to a WWE pay-per-view, and if we're going to do that, then I still think NXT surpassed TLC as far as quality of wrestling goes, but a lot of people will, will say, well, NXT is the wrestling brand, and WWE is more the entertainment brand. So Travis and I were talking last week, and, and he made some interesting comments looking at the current NXT roster, and especially the roster that performed at the show on Thursday, and Travis, your takeaway was that you didn't think a lot of the talent that was on Thursday's show are main roster talents per se for what the WWE is looking for in a superstar. I didn't think so whenever I was watching it. I, did, I liked a lot of them, and I liked what they were doing, but I couldn't imagine it translating to a 20,000-person arena, I guess, if, if that makes any sense, just from the way yeah. that I watched it. I don't know if that's how a lot of people view it or if that's how people within the industry might view some of those characters, but that's the what I took away from a lot of it. No, you know, Travis, it makes total sense. Um, the, and actually, that was, one, that was something I asked. I had asked uh, Triple H in, in, in our conversation, because he, he had mentioned, he made a mention in passing about he wanted to like try to take NXT to tour more. You know, right now they just kind of do like they do like some live events, but it's pretty much like just through Central Florida and, they, and sometimes through Georgia. And he said he really wants to start, you know, <clears throat> hitting the whole house, whole southeast region and then let it grow from there. And um, and I had said, well, obviously, goal number one being to get more eyeballs. I said, but wouldn't you say goal number two is to get these guys in front of different crowds and different demos? Because you know, like you know, Adam Rose might be the perfect example. You know, Adam Rose got over <clears throat> like Rover and NXT and that small re- repeat crowd. They just loved it. And then you know, you put them in front of a a younger demo, a kid's demo in a, in a 12,000 person arena on raw, you know, these kids don't know what the exotic express is. They don't, they don't really, you know, like, it's just, it, it hasn't connected the same way. And, uh, and, and he, and, he, and it, was, it was, it was an interesting, he kind of debated me on the Adam Rose point, but, it, but, it, but he did understand like it. I, and I agree with you, Travis. I think there are some characters, unfortunately, that are not completely necessarily adaptable to the main roster. But I think an interesting part of that is the difference in control. As we know, that NXT is completely ran by, by Hunter, and, and Vince still has the final say with the main roster. And an interesting, an interesting point, and I, took this, I talked about this today from a, from a caller on the radio show today, um, on Triple I Radio, is, uh, is, is Kevin Owens. You know, it's Kevin Steen. Uh, most people don't realize, like, you know, they talking about characters that may not translate. Well, it's not because, necessarily because Kevin's not good enough or his character's not good enough, but uh, people don't realize Vince McMahon has not yet seen uh, Kevin Owens. People don't realize that he absolutely he, he's heard the name. He knows that they've signed him. He know, but he he has not seen a match on the Indies or that one this past Thursday. Like and, and I'm very interested to see what he what his reaction is because um, you know Steen does not have the ideal body. Uh, even though that even again I, you know Mick Foley didn't and that worked out okay. Uh, but you know Kevin Kevin Owens is wrestling in those gym show like. But people don't realize Vince has not seen it. So like this character could be great on NXT and it could even have potential to work on the main roster. But again, it comes down to the uh, it's all in the and, and who's 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 controlling everything. And if 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 Vince feel that it's um, that, that that it's worthwhile, that it's got money written on it, then it, it may never even get a chance. So I, yeah, I mean you're right. There's some characters that just naturally might not fit, and there's other t- cases where they might fit, but we might never get a chance to really find out fairly. And, and and those are the ones that guys like Sami Zayn or Adrian Neville or those guys who are so good, and anybody that watches NXT can tell how good they are. And you want to you want those guys to succeed. The last thing I think anybody wants is to see somebody like that come out and they know how good they are and just have them flop and not have it work. Because for lack of a better way of putting it, some of those guys, maybe the career is better if you stay down there and are an enormous star in NXT Uh, as opposed to being a nobody on the main roster. I don't know. Well, you know, I I get what you're saying with that. And uh, the hard part about that is this. And uh, and again, another thing that a, a lot of fans don't necessarily realize um, so like, you know, when, when, Kevin signed, you know, he, he, you know, he was living in Canada, in Canada in uh, Montreal when Kevin signed, um, you know, he had to totally relocate to Florida, uh, take his kids out of school, uh, you know, wife, uh, you know, whatever, whatever her job was, she had to like, you know, they had to relocate to Florida and people don't realize like, um, uh, the, the, most of those NXT guys, they're not making most of them. I mean, I'm not, most of them, not, I'm not necessarily saying Kevin specifically, I'm not like revealing his finances, but most of the NXT guys don't make much more than $50,000. Um, 
So like that's that's the unfortunate thing. I mean, maybe that'll change over time, but I don't actually see it just because the main roster is losing money with the network or this and that, and, and the pay structure is changing. Like it, it's it, it kind of sucks because you kind of think, oh, this might not be a bad game. I'll just be a star in NXT for the rest of my life. Well, you can, but you'll you know not really be you know you're not. It's certainly not going to be profiting or, or you know the way that you would if you're on the main roster or even hell if you're on the indies. I mean, if there's some guys that really work the indies and work the, the, you know all around the world, they do it well enough. Um, and when you work the indies, if you're a big enough name, you can get your flight and all that stuff paid for. While well, WWE, you know, you're 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 paying for your travel because you're an independent contractor. So, it's a it's a very weird thing. But you know, I, but NXT is exciting. It's different. Um, I just hope that the transition of these guys from NXT to WWE is given a fair shake uh, with all parties considered. Yeah, I think you brought up a couple of good points there. One is. 50 grand to a lot of people um, might seem like a good thing, but when you're working for NXT and you have to move your entire family down there, and yeah, you are paying for your own gas, or if you get called up to the main roster, and you have you're no, paying and for you your own no, hotel room. And you have no medical. You have no medical yeah. coverage. There's not, and the one thing, too, I, I have a, you know, I got some guys, I know a bunch of guys in, in, you know, on main roster now, but when they got called up from NXT, they were still on their NXT contract until that ran out. So they were making the NXT money, but they had to pay like they were on the main roster. So they were paying for more hotels, right. and it was extremely difficult for them. It's not like in Major League Baseball where the Major League Baseball team will buy your minor league contract out. So um, you know that's something I think they can look into and change. And, and we're talking about these guys who might not, I guess, um, you know, go to the main roster and get over as much as NXT. And one guy is Adrian Neville. I, I fear that he might get lost in the shovel, as Travis mentioned, an awesome worker. I've been to a couple live events where he would open the shows where they do NXT things in the crowd. To their, I mean, they don't really understand NXT yet because they probably don't have the network or they're not watching it, and he doesn't have much build to it, and he's not the tallest guy on the roster. He's got a great body, great move set. I just fear that if they give him a weird gimmick, um, that if he falls flat, like Travis said, it, it's not going to be beneficial for him, and I really hope that that's not the case, especially with him because he deserves absolutely everything that he gets that comes to him because he's phenomenal. No, I agree. I, I I feel exactly the same. I, I I can't. I echo exactly everything you said about Neville. Um, from from his height to, you know, you know, they're going to need to give him. They need to give him something. We, you know, he needs a little bit of substance to him more so than just just the man that gravity forgot or whatever the tagline is. But um, you know, he's going to need more substance. But yeah, but he they also the danger of, of of giving him too something too crazy and it's just you know baffles everybody. I mean, guys like him are tough. It's um. Uh, Matt, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Matt Matt, Matt Cross. You know, very, really, really, yep. you know, Matt, Matt, a great indie worker. M Dog, yeah, yeah M Dog, a great indie worker. You know, he 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 was um, when you mentioned earlier to me uh, before we started recording about Cleveland. You know, he, he from Cleveland. He he worked out there. Now he's doing the Lucha Underground stuff, a son of havoc, which I'm happy for him. But I remember, <clears throat> you know, Matt's a great, <clears throat> a, a great. You know, what he can do in the ring is just unbelievable with his body. Um, you know, and I remember everybody's real disappointed. The indie fans were real disappointed when he got kicked out of uh, when he got eliminated on Tough Enough very quickly um, with with Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, because and for basically because he didn't have much character. And um, and I remember saying to people, I was like, you know, I, I love Matt. He's a great worker, and I hope the best happens for him. But you know, it's only only one of like there's a lot of there's a lot of guys like that that have like really good talents in terms of physical and ring stuff, but they don't necessarily have the most electric talk in the building. I said, and only one of a large number of those guys actually get to a chance to make in WWE. And Adrian Neville is that one guy like Adrian Neville is very much like a little bit bigger, but very much like a Matt Cross kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like, you know, it's like there's a bunch of Matt Crosses uh, not to make Matt Cross sound like a dime a dozen, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good talents that maybe not don't get as much chances as, as people would want. But in terms of getting a chance at WWE, it's a very random lucky process. And like Adrian Neville is that one guy that got it. And uh, it's, it's going to take, you know, Hunter had acknowledged to me on that media call. He said, you know, Neville couldn't barely speak at all when he came here, but now he put a mic in his hand and he's getting a little bit better. It's going to continue taking that kind of growth, but again, giving him some kind of a substance, some kind of a theme for people to connect to. Because, yeah, right now, all the cool stuff he does in the ring, it's great, but once we see it a couple times on a few big pay-per-views, he's seen it, so now you got to have something else to hold on to, and that needs to be a character. Justin, do you get the idea i guess from anybody that you've spoken to or even during any of these conversations that you had with triple h that uh almost that he would go to bat for these guys or he would hold them down to make sure that when they do come up they're coming up in the right situation to make sure that that say vince mcmahon or somebody else doesn't reach down and grab somebody too quick or bring him into something that's not going to be a 
advantageous situation for him? I, I definitely think he has their best interest at heart, and I definitely think that um, yeah, he would certainly go to bat for somebody that he believes in. Uh, but it, it's you know, but it, there's no telling of how effective that can be. You know, perfect example. You know, again, you know, Vince. I mean, unless I mean, obviously, first off, you know, obviously, Vince McMahon's. Um, you know, we, we all, we, no matter what critique we give, we all have to, I mean, without Vince McMahon, we, you know, I wouldn't be making a living off of wrestling. You guys wouldn't be doing this podcast. You know, Vince McMahon is Vince McMahon. He's, but at the same time, you know, it is still a one, it is still his rule. It's his way of the highway. And, um, like a perfect example is a lot of people were upset two weeks ago when Charlotte lost on that roll up on raw against Natalia. Well, that was a big part of that, of, of, of our conversation. Um, and Hunter had said he wanted uh, you know, he, he wanted, um, well, actually he didn't technically say this, but I found out he, he wanted Charlotte to win. Um, uh, but, but, but Natalia wanted Charlotte to win, but Vince didn't, you know? And so it's, it's something like that. Like, I mean, you know, Triple H can go to bat all he wants and, and he can, and he can try to make the situation presented as best as possible. But, you know, if Vince feels something, um, he feels it and it's very, I guess it's kind of very hard. It seems to change his mind. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's gonna. I'm sure, I'm sure he has best interest in heart, but it's it, it's still when it's not at the end of the day when it's not your final call. That's just a tough situation. So, you know. and I actually thought Vince made the right call. I thought Charlotte should have done the job. I, uh, given you know, and I, you know, I think it was the right call. You know, and I kind of you know, Ryan, it's, it's not a popular opinion, and I, I and I, I, I tweeted this live when that happened two rolls ago, and I still stirred form with it. Um, I, I kind of agree. You know, I kind of agree. I don't really have so much of a problem with it either simply because it was a roll up. So it didn't make, it didn't hurt her. Um, exactly. You know, it, 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 it you know, she's going to have a great career 10 years from now when she's won the Divas title, however many times and had all these great matches, nobody's going to look back and go, Oh, well, her career was, was, was effed from the beginning when she lost in that two minute roll up. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, she's not a regular part of the main roster. It was a one-off co-promotional thing. So I'm okay with the two. I didn't really bother me. I mean, it, granted now, if she would have won, I would have been fine with that too. Um, right. But if she would have won, I would have wanted it to have been the same finish, a roll up, so it didn't hurt Natalia. Exactly. Um, if, if she would have tapped out to the sharpshooter, maybe then I have a little problem to it. Yeah. Uh, but she was protected, and she looks strong in a loss. So, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the main thing. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, it's, yeah. I mean, is she in the grand scheme of things, people forget. Yes, I, you know, like the, the the smart fans forget. Yes, we know you know that how that Charlotte's really good. But but to the to, but WWE books to the most casual fan, and to the casual fan, this is a main roster person in Natalia who they've seen. Every week for the last however many years, and here's a chick who they haven't seen, so the tie is going to win. <laughs> you know. Absolutely, Justin. Is the main roster frustrated right now? Uh, yeah, it seems like they are from from, um, from what I read and then from those who I talk to. Um, it, it seems like it's a. I don't want to say morale is like, you know at an all-time low or anything like that, but it, it, there's just a lot of change. The business is changing. I mean, we always hear that all oh, the business is changing. But this, the business is changing more so now than it has in a long, long time from both the standpoint of NXT and like, and it's kind of like, oh, the grass might be greener on the other side of the company in NXT and, and the people running NXT versus the people running the main roster versus the difference in pay. No more pay-per-view buys really, or at least not as strong of pay-per-view buys because you have the network and the boys aren't yet getting you know paid you know, for how well the network does or doesn't do, um, and, you know, and, that, and, and, and more places, and then the business is changing because more places are starting to try to creep up, Lucha Underground and, you know, uh, GFW once it gets going. So uh, I, I definitely seems like from those who I talk to and what I read, um, it, it seems like there's certainly a frustration uh, with the roster. And then <laughs> uh, I, we can't talk about frustration with the roster without mentioning um, the, 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 the brass ring comment, uh, <laughs> Right. It's from Vince McMahon. Certainly, um, it, it did not go unnoticed by much of the locker room, and, and it uh, it sparked some frustration of like, you know, they can only do so much. And again, I'm not there, so I mean, I'm not. I don't want to go like on a bashing Vince tirade because again, I, I, that's not really my call. But it, it, there's definitely a frustration, and I think a lot of it is justified, or at least needs to be addressed. Um, so yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, that sucks. And I have, I hope it gets better. I hope um, I hope things. Hope things start to take a positive turn here as they get towards their most profitable time of the year. Yeah, and I can understand, you know, on Monday Night Raw, you're given four minutes to go out there and put in a match, and you can't showcase what you're capable of doing, I guess, to compete with what NXT is giving us. But Sunday's TLC pay-per-view, every match had a decent time, you know, to go. And Dolph and Luke Harper obviously started the show extremely hot. The match was fantastic. Those two had 
I, I'm, I'm torn between that and the tables match because the tables match psychology wise made a lot of sense to me uh, as far as match of the night. But they were three matches on Sunday's pay per view that I thought were really good, and that was the tables, the ladders, and then the the main event I thought was was really well done as well. Um, but the other matches kind of just fade into the background, and I feel like those are the opportunities that the talent really needs to take. Um, and step up and show a little bit more what they're capable of because they're given 10, 12 minutes or, you know, the, the reins are a little bit loose in a situation like that. What, your overall perception of Sunday's pay-per-view, the takeaway? Um, I think you and I are probably on a similar path, uh, similar similar uh, opinion. It, it was what it was. Uh, it, it didn't disappoint me, you know, but at the same time, nothing really – um, yeah, I, I thought I thought Ziggler and Harper was the best match. That was the match I enjoyed the most. That was I thought the opener was just um, – I, I thought it, was just, it set a bar that it was just very hard to beat. Um, uh, I thought all the marquee matches did at least uh, did. You know, I thought Rollins and Cena. It was exactly what I thought it'd be, and you know, and, and nobody can outwork Cena's work ethic. Um, you know, Rollins and Ambrose was good. There was some. There was a few psychological things that I was kind of like nitpicking at, um, just in my own. Mm-hmm. Not not saying even that I'm right, but it was just my own little perfect personal preferences. Uh, I can't ever remember a a TV exploding being part of the finish, so that's pretty neat. But um. <laughs> But I, I was. Did, did you have a problem with that? Did you have a problem with the TV exploding on Ambrose? You know, um, it, I'm going to say no for this reason because uh, all, too often, I mean, I'm guilty. I get guilty of it too, and especially the fans, uh, the hoi, the, the hoi polloi on Twitter. We 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 um, uh, we, we bitch about you know we we, we we bitch about lack of creativity and the same old thing or whatever. So it was a little bit different. It, it a little bit different. A little bit. Um, I don't know what the word is. Not I was gonna say supernatural. It's not supernatural to have a TV explode, but it was a little, you know, it kind of fit these two crazy, mysterious kind of characters. That that would be something in the finish. Uh, it, it, I, I my, my my biggest nitpick to it was <laughs> the commentators did a great job, by the way. You know, like justifying it, like like telling people like oh like, like Michael Cole did it like the King, like well King that's that's under there because if. You know, we, we you know if if something happens with our monitors, our tech crew has that, and I'm like, why do they put the really nice flat screen under the ring, and you guys get the, right. the 1985 bulky monitors, but um, yeah. that are in black and white? But um, I didn't mind it. I really didn't mind it. And, and the show overall was okay. It really wasn't anything special. Um, uh, I didn't watch it live again because of my schedule. I ended up watching it later in the middle of the night. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't regret watching it, but I certainly had no interest to go back and watch it again. Yeah. There, there are two things that the WWE, or a couple things, I guess, WWE has been doing lately that irritates me more than anything is when they, they give us something and then they fail to explain why it happened or any sort of follow-up. Uh, case in point, one is Nikki and Brie Bella. I don't understand. I mean, as a fan, I'm trying to remove myself from the situation as a wrestler, but as a fan, I don't understand why all of a sudden everything is good after 30 days. Right. <laughs> um, you know, up until, up until recently, they didn't address Seth Rollins curb stomping Brock Lesnar. Now they've been doing it, which is good. But one big thing is Sting. And I, to me, from the outside, why was Sting there? It makes no sense mm-hmm. to all of a sudden a man who never worked in the company to come in and, and cost the authority the – the power at B and for one time appearance. And there really hasn't been a ton of follow up on that. And I know that we're probably leading to a potential Sting Seth Rollins match at WrestleMania, the way things are kind of going, or a Triple H match. But do you think they use Sting the way they should have used him in his WWE okay. debut? Yeah, you know, I, actually, I don't mind the debut. I thought the debut was good, how they, you know, him, him being put in that factor. But I, I agree with you in the fact that it's just been not seeing him since, just kind of weird. And like, I mean, they've at least made an effort to say his name every week. So it's like, at least they haven't forgot about it, and I know now they're starting to try to <clears throat> refer to him as the vigilante, and you know, obviously, you know, right. kind of playing into him, you know, coming in and causing chaos to the to the power. Um, I, I think I don't mind the use of him at the, at the Survivor Series, but I, I do, I do have a problem with, like, yeah, he showed up and it was such a big moment, and then it's like, well, why? <laughs> and then, and it's fine to have a little bit of a cliffhanger for us to find out why, but like, if we don't find out why until February, then I'm kind of like annoyed, you know. Yeah, that's the, that's what I feel about the same thing. Is if they're going to wait this long, then just bring him back at the Royal Rumble. Would we bring him back three months early if we're not going to say anything until the road to WrestleMania anyway? Yeah, it, it's. Yeah. I guess I feel like my intelligence is insulted from time to time, and when they do certain things, I mean, obviously they try things. For instance, Eric Rowan 
character, if you recall, maybe a month and a half ago, he walked out to the ring and asking, where is she? You know, right. I think if it was Renee Young or whatever. And then Whoa. all of a sudden, we're under the assumption that halfway through that Raw, they decided to put him in the main event with John Cena at Survivor Series. That was kind of like a, a, a I don't, I, I can't foresee that being the long-term plan no, right, yeah. as far as, you know, that happening. But it's just they kind of erase it and expect us to forget about it. And maybe some people probably do, but, you know, people like us, I guess, more likely don't forget about it, and you just were left wondering, okay, well, what the hell are you doing here? Well, I'll defend the. I, you are right. They do that. They 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 tend to just things that go unanswered. I will defend the Eric, and and I guess a lot of them probably are justified. And I can tell you the justification with the Rowan one. That one, I get it. It was just a, you know, Sheamus got legit hurt that night, and um, Sheamus got legit hurt that night. And, and if you want, and then earlier before he got hurt that night on that Raw, the Go Home Raw before Survivor Series. Um, there was that pre tape, yeah, I mean, and there was that pre tape. Uh, it was when Angry Kitty or Angry Cat or whatever the hell it was. Um, it was that that, <laughs> That's right. that terrible pre tape, and Rowan was in the back with the cat. It was really awkward. And if you look, he actually had his, um, he still had like that Wyatt family logo patch on his on his jumpsuit. And so then Seamus gets hurt, and they were like, okay, he's hurt. He's going to the hospital. He's probably not going to be in the Survivor Series match. This is not one of those matches where we can make a game time decision. Like we have to know if he's on the team or not. So then, when they did that whole bit where the, like we're all where the where it was like okay who who's gonna actually come around and be with Team Cena and, and then Ziggler shows up and Big Show shows up, um, and then they hit they made a la- they literally made such a last minute call for Rowan to come out they ripped the patch off they told him to go out there, um, Luke Harper and a, and a bunch of the guys on the Authority side didn't know that he was coming out, um, <laughs> they they because they because they hit Harper's music because they had right. they had not yet created individual single music for Rowan yet they hit Harper's music and if you go back and watch it like Harper's face. Like and then and then, and then here comes Rowan and it, it was it was that was a genuine shock so like and I'm justifying that one like yeah so whatever they were gonna do with the where is she and the heel stuff there obviously they just scrapped it for the time being because they said all right we need a baby face and you're gonna be the baby face um, but yeah you're right it, they do they definitely insult intelligence sometimes it gets frustrating and I think that's a I think that can be sometimes a a, a result of um, too, you know too many too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes you know. Yeah, and, and anything that benefits Rowan, I'm a fan of. Rowan and I used to be tag partners back on the NDC before he signed with WWE. So oh, nice. anything that gets him a push, by all means, take it. But uh, a couple, two questions here, and then we can kind of wrap things up. One, speaking of Eric Rowan, him and Luke Harper had a match on Raw two weeks ago, I believe it was. Do you think it's a wasted opportunity by the WWE not to take advantage of that situation? Because in my opinion, there was no backstory of, of why these two should even get in the ring together and fight each other. Like, what happened between these two? We don't know. I think they could have sold some sort of program better than Row and Big Show, you know, to lead to these guys at maybe Royal Rumble or something along those lines to why the former Wyatt family members are now hating each other and want to tear each other's head off. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. No, that 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 that, that made me upset when, when they did that because I, I, I thought the same thing was a wasted opportunity. You know, that could have been something... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, not want to say it was. I'm not want to say it could have been big money, but it's certainly something that people, right. people would have cared to like. You know, here's two guys that were, you know, mentally, you know, brainwashed and 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 part of this, you know, unique faction, and then all of a sudden they're set free, quote unquote, by Bray Wyatt. You know, like so. Okay, so eventually when they're going to cross paths and fight each other, there, there could be a lot of backstory other than that. There could be a lot of. Um, we could learn a lot about their characters and learn about. Uh, where they were before the Wyatt family. There's just so many opportunities from a creative mind that they could have done. And yeah, so then just to throw them in this um, random match on Raw, just to, just to get yourself to TLC, it was like, ugh, you know, that that that, that was unfortunate. Does Lesnar leave Royal Rumble with the title? Uh, yes, I think he does. Um, Even if he doesn't sign a new contract, or if he does in fact go to Bellator or UFC, do you think they take the strap off him before Mania, or do you think he? Main events, Mania. I think he. T- I, I'll put it this way: if he does not take that belt to Mania, if he does not go into Mania as champion, then I really then then this whole uh, um, this whole experiment of him being the champion and only coming around every so often and trying to make it a special attraction has been wasted. If he drops the t- if he if he becomes champion and the only person he fights is John Cena and on the third time John Cena beats him. It's that's it's just it's a waste, and it's nothing. That's not against Cena. That's just that's just a, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's Cena or if it was uh, anybody else. It, it doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't matter if it was Big Show. If, if he wrestled Big Show three times and finally Big Show beat him, like if, if Cena is the only person that he fights in this entire reign, and they don't go into, I mean that that, that there's there's there there is huge money there to have Brock Lesnar, you know, dominate John Cena three times and beat him. 
um, and, and to carry that title into WrestleMania, and 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 whoever he whoever eventually takes that title from him, it becomes a made man. Uh, now, who you know who that could be? It's a very short list of believable possible candidates. I, I, I would love to see a fatal four way with all three Shield guys against Lesnar, but that probably won't happen. I think the most realistic, if I had to put money on it, the most realistic thing at this very moment would actually be a babyface Randy Orton versus Brock Lesnar. Um, but that said. Brock absolutely has to go into Mania as champion. If he doesn't, then they just the, the, this whole thing was a waste. So you think that he faces Orton at Mania, or do you think it's Roman Reigns? I think it's Orton. Um, God, I'd love it. I'd be so much happier seeing that than Reigns, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think it's Orton, and, and, here, and here's the thing we have to remember, too. I think it's Orton, and um, whoever they put Lesnar against so, – so, okay, so they have to put Lesnar against somebody who's believable. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Dolph Ziggler fans. I'm sorry, Daniel Bryan fans. That's just not, it's just not believable. They have to right. they have to put him against somebody, you know. And Randy's six foot five. He's got a look to him. He looks like a guy that could kick somebody's ass. Like, <clears throat> but whoever they put him up against, if they take the title from him, it doesn't mean they have to walk out as Mania as champion because you still have Seth Rollins with that briefcase. And how poetic would it be for Randy Orton to slay the monster, slay the beast, and then Seth Rollins come out and basically steal the title with Money in the Bank? And now I know a lot of people are going to say, well, it's WrestleMania. You, you can't end like that. You know, baby faces usually triumph. Well, remember, we're probably going to have a sting match at Mania, so the title match does not necessarily have to go last. Um, and we've certainly seen that WWE is not afraid of putting um, special attraction grudge matches uh, last on Mania and putting the title earlier. So Brock could drop the title earlier in the night, and 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 and, and, and Rain, or uh, excuse me, Rollins comes and cashes in and wins. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the final image. The final image could be, um, oh hell, Jesus, let 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 Rollins. Or actually, you know, here you mentioned earlier. Fuck, Sting versus Seth Rollins. Um, you know, maybe you put Sting last, but earlier in the night, Rollins comes out, cashes in. So now all of a sudden, it's turned Rollins and uh, Sting into a title match, an uh, impromptu title match. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, that that might be too complicated for WWE. Uh, I mean, I, I'd like it. I think it'd be unique and, and definitely something different. But you never know. I mean, we're off, we're what five and a half weeks until Royal Rumble, then the official road to San Francisco starts. Before that, before I let you go, we have Impact Wrestling moving to Destination America, which I never even realized was a channel. But uh, we have Ken Anderson coming up here in a couple of weeks to talk about it. How, iron- that how, you- how ironic is it that moving to a channel called that has the word destination in it, and I can't find the fucking channel? Um. Right. <laughs> At all. I mean, I had to Google it, and I don't even know if I get it, uh, to be honest with you. I, I hope to get more information from Ken here in a couple of weeks as far as what actually is going to entail in these programs. But they're going to have two shows on Destination America. Are you? Do you know much more than that at this point? I know their budget is probably being cut significantly. Um, I don't know much more. I, I don't know much more than that. Do you have any information <clears throat> I know the, on Impact? I know the budget's being cut. I know um, a lot of the guys that work for them are still have not been given the TV dates yet. Uh, they've been given like the very first ones, but they have not been given like they they, they keep being told by TNA management. Uh, to sit tight, and we're going to give you it through like May, so that way you can have your schedule all set. Uh, but they haven't got it yet, and I know that the main show, the Impact, is going to be on on Fridays. Which, to me, if Destination America says they're going to build around, you know, if, if TNA Impact, if TNA is supposed to be your flagship programming, I don't, I've never heard of a channel building their flagship programming around a Friday night. But that's you know, I don't know. Right. I think maybe Sci-Fi, maybe a little bit with SmackDown, but I don't know if they really. I don't think it built their channel well, around SmackDown. They brought it on later on, obviously. So yeah, and, and, yeah, and one well, hell, and, and SmackDown's going to move back to Thursdays. So. Right, and then last question before we let you go. Uh, you mentioned Global Force being a promotion that we're kind of still waiting to what you know see exactly what it's going to be. It's been a lot of talk, a lot of vignettes with Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Uh, but they're obviously promoting New Japan Pro Wrestling's huge Wrestle Kingdom 9 show, which happens January 4th at the Tokyo Dome. It's going to be available in America on pay-per-view for the first time, and it's basically like WrestleMania, 80,000 people. Uh, Jim Ross is, is going to be covering it with Matt Stryker. Uh, we got Lance Hoyt here, or Lance Archer, known to the New Japan fans on the end of the month. He's in, a, um, I guess, an eight-man tag match at the show. Are you going to tune in to the January 4th show? I probably will. Um, I, I was actually just thinking about that the other day. Um, I probably will. Um, I'm, I'm interested. You know, I want to see this. Um, I have you know, some friends that will be over there on the show, so I'm interested in that. Obviously, 80,000 people. Obviously, um, Jim Rouse and Matt Stryker are both tremendous talents in that role. Both of them have been, you know, personally have been great uh, inspirations and great friends and networking to me. So I, I, there's so much about it that I like. So I'm interested. Um, uh, yeah, I'll watch. And uh, I, I'm just like you said, I, I'm very curious past – 
uh, Jeff Jarrett hype videos, <laughs> what, what we're really in store for. But Yeah, a lot of hype. A lot of hype and hasn't been much to show. So maybe January 4th is beginning. I, I don't know. Maybe he'll start actually running shows on his own, you know, with his partnership with New Japan. We'll see. I've always been under the idea, and it's not – I love J- Japanese wrestling. It's very strong style. It's very different. I always thought it wouldn't translate well to America. But maybe Jim Ross and Matt Stryker is going to help with that, having some English-speaking commentators. But – at the end of the day, I, it's still tough in America to sell anything, and in, in, in it's not I – mean, I don't know if it's race or what it is, but it's still hard to sell something different than what we're used to in WWE. And I guess we'll see if this sparks any interest and changes anything on the wrestling front moving forward. But the indie scenes are hot. Wrestling is hot, at least on that level. And WWE, if they can – Maybe take a few things from NXT and sharpen up their program into WrestleMania. It could be an extremely awesome show from San Francisco. Um, are you going to be there? I will be there. Uh, always there at WrestleMania, um, as always. And, and uh, we'll be doing our different chair shot reality events. Um, we always end up doing, you know, I, I started years ago. I started the Kevin Nash party, and, and that's kind of uh, Dave here and those guys that kind of grabbed that and ran with that, mm-hmm. and, and they do a tremendous job. Uh, uh, we'll have... Um, Actually, I guess I'll just make the announcement now. I think I can do it. Uh, I don't think I've actually said this publicly, so here you go. Here's your uh, here's, awesome. here's your tagline. Uh, Vin, there it is, uh, breaking news. Uh, Vince Russo will be a chair shot all weekend, so there'll nice. be a lot of uh, different ways to meet Vince and hang out with us. And um, uh, very shortly, we will be releasing the details for our second annual chair shot reality fan experience auction, which what that is is that we started last year, and it was a huge success. Um, we, have an, we have an eBay auction where... Uh, people can bid uh, for obviously a certain amount of time, but once that bidding's over, uh, the person that wins gets um, it, it's good for two. It's good for them and a guest. Uh, they get to they get to sit two tickets to sit with myself, um, the guys and the guys and girls from Chairshot Reality at WrestleMania. So we have your WrestleMania tickets covered, and then you're also gonna have some other um, things included such as dinners, drinks. Uh, we'll be doing um, you know a couple different events with some wrestlers and personalities. Uh, Blake, the guy who won our auction last year, he's actually did, uh, recorded a video for us, which we're going to make public here soon. He talked about like all the different wrestlers he got to hang out with and meet. I mean, he's you know sitting you know at a bar at 2 a.m. with some of these guys and telling stories. So like he had a you know fantastic experience, tons of good pictures, and we're going to do that again and let somebody just tag along with us and have fun. And um, so yeah, so that'll be a good time. Legit. And Blake wasn't the man who started to fight with Seamus on Bourbon Street last year, was he? No, no, he was not. Okay. No, we were across the street, and uh, Seamus got into a fist fight with somebody. It was it was kind of funny. Um, it happened the night before Mania, did, I think. Did, that was did, right? did he really? Yeah, it was uh, some dude tried to climb the balcony and then went inside, and then Seamus had his shirt off, and the cops were there. It was fantastic. It was it was great entertainment uh, Saturday night before the show on Bourbon Street, but it's it's always good entertainment on Bourbon Street. So, um, awesome. Well, if people want to follow you, you're on Twitter at Justin Labar. You guys, you have a Chair Shot Reality Twitter account. What's the Twitter handle for that? Uh, the Chair Shot one is at CS Reality. Awesome. Also on Facebook, you're on Facebook. So anybody want to check them out? Obviously. He does contribute to WrestleZone.com. You guys can go there, too. Justin, dude, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, Vince Russo with you guys, WrestleMania Weekend. It's going to be big. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be plenty of, uh, like I said, we're, we're going to be doing a Q&A with them. We're going to be doing um, our normal free CSR, kind of like pre-WrestleMania party. We're going to be we're planning. Um, again, we haven't really talked about this, so kind of first first here and here. Uh, we're going to be doing a, um, if, if those of you that like wine, if you're a wine drinker, we're going to be doing a very special uh, and a great value. Uh, wine, it's gonna be a very exclusive, small wine tasting, uh, and it's also gonna be a hall. It's we're, we're gonna do it's gonna be a wine tasting with wine and cheese, and I mean, you're, and you're gonna get tons of wine for a great price, um, and you're gonna get bottles to take home that we're all gonna sign, and we're gonna have a big screen in this room watching the WWE Hall of Fame Saturday night. So it, it's it, we have so many great stuff going on. So awesome. But yeah, guys, if you're out there listening, make sure you guys been on that eBay experience for WrestleMania weekend. Follow Justin on Twitter again, at Justin Labar. Justin, dude, thank you so much for coming on, man. We'll catch up again soon, I promise you that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it again. You're listening to The Pencil, the professional wrestling podcast featuring me, the one and only Ready D. Every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. Find us online at PencilPodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at PencilPodcast.